Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here for this week's Know Your Foe episode with the Miami Dolphins coming to town on Sunday at 1 p.m. Thankfully, at 1 p.m. Didn't really want a night game there. Uh, but joining us to talk about it is a former Baltimore Sun reporter, Daniel Oyafusi. Dan, I, I always have to ask if I pronounce your name correctly. No, you got it. You, we, we've been through this. You got it. You're, you're a pro. <laughs> All right. Well, much appreciated. Thanks for coming on. You have defected down to Miami and in our, our current weekly terms and uh, uh, really happy to have you. But you cover the Miami Dolphins now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, I uh, covered uh, the Ravens for two seasons, uh, kind of a dream job, dream opportunity for me. Uh, but life took me to South Florida where I'm enjoying the the sun. But, you know, I always got love for my hometown. Yeah, it's blinding in the background there. We're having a, a nice rainy day here and uh, and your background. But, whew, just getting me. All right. Well, anyway, uh, let's talk about the Dolphins a little bit. Obviously, this is this is one of the biggest um uh games of the entire season that was true last week in terms of, of what the ravens went through in terms of their litmus test against the 49ers but the, this dolphins game has much more in terms of playoff implications for the ravens um and uh, and the, the the number one seed is more or less on the line as it looks like the bills will have nothing to play for in week 18 and the dolphins will have to try and get the win but they they will be very well positioned for the one seed if they if they win this game yeah, most definitely. You know, if the with, with the obviously with the Ravens when they clinch the number one seed, uh, with the Dolphins when they're in the driver's seat and they clinch the AFC East. Um, so, like you said, this is more or less for the top seed home field advantage in that first round by in the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, you know, there's been talk around here that uh, Ravens fans, some of them, don't really want it after what happened in 2019 and the and the loss in the divisional round of the Titans and oh, all the rust and whatnot of taking Week 18 off and then we you know, the wild card week off. Uh, I don't buy any of that crap for, for the, for the record. <laughs> Do the dolphins feel at all strongly about, uh, you know, or has it been, has it been mentioned about rust being a, a, a risk for the team if they take a week off? Well, um, amongst players and coaches, they don't want to talk about it at all. Mike McDaniel, the head coach, jokingly last week told players to tell the members of the media to, quote unquote, with all due respect, F off. If they didn't mention uh, uh, anything but the Cowboys, I think amongst the fan base, they definitely want that number one seed because they've been so good at home 19 and three uh, in their last 22 home games. So they definitely want that number one seed, especially given some of the injuries that we'll get into later. Mm hmm. All right. That's a big that's a big deal. And I guess the Ravens in, in a similar position dealing with a lot of injuries that they would like to have that extra week of rest. So it's going to be a big game. Um, I, I just got to tell you, go back to my time as a kid in 1975. The Baltimore Colts met the Miami Dolphins in an enormous game. It became what known as the fog game um, that the uh, Ravens, uh, sorry, the Colts ended up winning 10 to 7 over the Dolphins. And uh, it's only the second game that I ever went to. And uh, just just a great memory from that. But it, this is a similar kind of feeling coming up on this game that there's just so much on the line and uh, uh, very exciting. But anyway, uh, Daniel wanted to uh, uh, get right into it with you. And maybe we start with talking about Tua and, uh, and how he's developed this season. Yeah, I think the best way to describe to a Tungvalu's 2023 season and, um, you know, fittingly, McDaniel spoke about that as I actually asked him about um, his growth from that week two game last year uh, is the mastery of the offense. I think that he's been put in a perfect system after some early uh, uh, career struggles. He's been put in a system that takes uh, and utilizes his anticipation, his accuracy, um, his ability uh, to, to read the middle of the field and get uh, the ball in the hands of playmakers. Um, and Mike McDaniel said that, you know, if you compare where Tua was in the week two game last year, uh, he was a 20 year old and now he's a 32 year old. He's in his prime. He's seasoned. Um, he's seen a lot and he just knows how to go about um, the offense, getting guys set up, um, knowing how defenses uh, want to attack him and the ways to kind of find uh, th those or those counters to it. So I think that's the best way to it. He's obviously healthy. And I think we're seeing that in maybe a stronger arm, his ability to put more on passes. Um, but it's just an overall control of the offense where he's kind of the point guard and he's getting out to his getting the ball out to his big uh, play playmakers now we've seen a uh, the Ravens uh, play a style that has confused the hell out of most of the teams they've played so far in terms of really starting with a too high shell on a lot of plays rotating out of that a lot of of uh, uh, coverage that differs on different sides of the field whether they're playing zone or man a lot of uh, matchup zone um, and uh, and a lot of rotation into different coverages that that are not necessarily expected uh, but usually playing with a fairly light box. Now, Miami uh, has, I've seen very divergent 
numbers on Miami. They have a significantly negative EPA per play on runs, which is surprising given um, A-Chain, and I want to pronounce his name, but it's it's A-Chan, right? A-Chan. A-Chan, okay. But A-Chan uh, has had, obviously, a terrific year that that is very similar in a lot of ways to what Keaton Mitchell did before he was hurt. And then, of course, Mostert uh, has, has had what I think people look at as saying is a, is a good year as well. But what is what is holding back their EPA per play in terms of the run game? Well, they're 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 a big play offense. You know, they have uh, a track team. We call them a four by one track team um, mm-hmm. uh, of of skill position players. Um, so they hit a lot of those 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 big runs, those 10, 15 yard runs. But we've seen a, a problem and really dating back to last year with this offense is situational. So when you get into third and short and those third down situations where they do try to run the ball, they're not as successful. Um, so, you know, they like to get to the outside. But sometimes when they try to run inside or even when they try to get the ball to the outside uh, on those key downs, not successful so i think that's why we see um the raw stats show that the top 10 top five in rushing but maybe the efficiency isn't there at times yeah it's it's incredible just looking at uh achan i hn is at 4.8 sorry at 8.1 yards per carry and mostert at 4.8 you would not think that that would be an inefficient running team i know the ravens are only one of three teams that's truly efficient above the the, the zero mark in, in terms of EPA, but the Dolphins are middle of the pack in the league with numbers like that. It just it's it's surprising to me anyway. But I think you've explained it there with the with some of the situational running. Um talk about the uh, about the the running backs themselves and any description. Yeah, well, we have to start with Raheem Mostert, who was actually a former Raven at one point. I think he was uh, the, the Ravens were the first team um, that that cut him back, and I would say 2015. He's he's had an age defying season. I describe it: 31 years old, um, you know, a year or two removed from a serious knee injury that he thought might have threatened his NFL career. Um, he's thriving in this offense, and obviously, he knows the offense, the zone running uh, Shanahan style offense from this time with Mike McDaniel uh, with the 49ers. Um, he he's just healthy and rejuvenated, and, and he. And it really ties into the kind of the growth of this offensive line as well, um, whether, you know, they have more comfort in the second year of this scheme. Um, he's taking advantage of it. So obviously you have the speed, um, but he has a power as well. You know, he'll grind out uh, a couple extra yards as well. So, again, an age-defying season is the best way that you can put it. Uh, Devon A. Chan, uh, their third-round pick. Mike McDaniel was so hyped to get this guy. Um, you know, he was uh, a track runner, you know, uh, kind of on the verge of an of Olympic tra- uh type of track runner um he might be the fastest guy on the team don't let Tyreek Hill hear that but he might be the fastest guy on the team um he's dealt with some injuries you know he had a torrid start in the first uh, month or so of the season first half of the season but he sustained a knee injury mid-season that's uh forced him to miss some time he's back in the fold um hasn't been as dynamic as we've seen but he still has that big play threat uh and then you kind of round it out with Jeff Wilson uh, more of a power back slasher uh between the tackles type of guy um but though they'll, they'll throw him in there uh, uh at times as well who's been their short yardage guy uh, Raheem Mostert, surprisingly, and, you know, they'll throw A-Chan in there as well. But Raheem Mostert, I mean, you know, we talk about the speed, but he has that physicality as well. And they trust him to get some uh, tough yards. But they'll also throw in Jeff Wilson in there. You know, when Mostert was uh, injured uh, in that Dallas game and they needed to pick up some tough yards uh, late uh, on the game winning drive, you know, they relied on Jeff Wilson to, to get those tough yards. Uh, do they use any pony? They do. They do a lot. And, and and the thing about this team is, you know, Mike McDaniel, um, you know, he's quick to note that these guys are, are, are fast guys, but no, that's not all that they can do. Um, so they will they will line up, you know, H hand in the slot and put Mostert uh, in the backfield. They'll put both of those guys in the backfield, put them in over orbit motion. They've, they've increasingly made use of that this year. I think that that's mainly because of H hand. Uh, they they. He, he's a fast guy, but they want him to be a do it all. I mean, they, they use him a lot, honestly, the same way they, that they use Tyreek in terms of uh, um, different alignments and different uh, motions. A, a gadget player, a, HN is their primary gadget player now, or is Hill still a, a primary there in terms of the guy who you see jet motion from, the guy who you may get the, the front tosses to right in front of the quarterback? Yeah. Um, yeah, you'll see both of those guys do that. I mean, it, it really it, – it's this offense and the growth of it has been really, really interesting in year two because, again, I think that they really want to use A-Chan the way that they use Tyreek, just a guy that can get the ball in a multitude of ways. So they'll throw some end around, some reverses, some tosses like that, uh, most definitely. And then they do that with Tyreek, obviously, too. All right, yeah, so we, we definitely associate that with Tyreek. Um, is there uh, – to go take us through the wide receiver core. 
Yeah, I mean, you got to start with Tyreek Hill, um, you know, prior to uh, an ankle injury that forced him to miss uh, the Jets game two weeks ago. He was on pace for the first 2000 yard season. Um, you know, they've really talked about his growth as a route runner. You know, you know, he's in year nine or so. Um, but, you know, he just has kind of similar to Tua, just an, uh, a mastery of the offense, kind of knowing how defenses and defensive backs and secondaries want to cover him. Um, so obviously, you know, he, he's a threat to, to score from anywhere on the field, you know, the, the Ravens will obviously be keyed on him. Um, you go to Jalen Waddle, who had a bit of a tough season. I mean, he's still in a 1,000-yard th- season, third straight year to start his career. Um, but he's dealt with some injuries. The latest is a, a high ankle sprain that forced him to miss Wednesday practice. Um, Mike McDaniel said that he wouldn't rule him out just because he's that tough of a player. But um, just the nature of the injury and the fact that the Dolphins have taken a very cautious approach uh, with their key players this season – I personally don't expect him to play, um, but if he's out there, I mean, obviously they'll have to account for him as well. Um, you know, he, he's kind of had some ups and downs where, you know, he's not on the same page with Tua, which is kind of weird because they have that chemistry dating back to their time in Alabama. Um, but as we've seen, uh, especially in week two, um, he's another one of those guys who can score from anywhere on the field. If he can't play, um, th- th- it gets a little interesting because – Robbie Chosen, formerly known as Robbie Anderson, um, he's in concussion protocol and we haven't really seen uh, people, uh, players be cleared in enough time to play. Um, he's another one of those guys that they like to um, put out on those deep, those deep overs, those uh, streaks to kind of uh, free up the middle of the field. If he can't play, then you're kind of looking at a guy like Chase Claypool, who they traded for last year, or excuse me, a couple uh, weeks ago at the trade deadline. Um, you know, he might have to step into a role. They might have to elevate one of their guys from the practice squad. And then you're getting down to guys like Braxton Berrios, uh, River Craycraft, who are more uh, slot guys, uh, more shifty than really downfield speed, uh, but they rely on them a lot um, in those condensed formations when they do those crack tosses. Um, You know, they, especially Craycraft, he's really the best blocker, Um, but those guys are more blocking possession type receivers than uh, downfield burner type guys. So has Claypool gotten on the field much for the Dolphins so far? He hasn't. He hasn't. You know, he dealt with some injuries as well, but, you know, it's a complex offense. Um, they He's really been slowly um, uh, kind of ingratiated into that offense. Um, but if Waddle and uh, Chosen can't play, uh, I think that he would definitely see an uptick uh, in snaps as well. As Cedric Wilson, who I didn't mention as well, but he's, again, more of a, of a possession type receiver. Mm-hmm. All right. Outstanding. I, uh, the tight end group. Yeah, uh, I haven't checked the stats recently, but I believe that this offense throws the the fewest passes to their tight ends. This is a wide receiver and running back uh, passing offense, but uh, they do have Durham Smythe, who's kind of their uh, do it all. He'll block, um, you know, he'll he'll run some routes as well. He actually had his best game of the season against Dallas, which I think was because uh, Dallas was doing a lot of too too high deep safeties to take away the uh, the, the deep throws. They left the middle of the field a lot um, open a lot, and the Dolphins took advantage of that by throwing to Smythe. Um, but he's not really a factor in the passing game. They have a rookie Julian Hill who has the athletic traits uh, to maybe develop into that, but he's more of a blocker. Uh, but Smythe will take the majority of the snaps, probably 75 to 80 percent of those tight end snaps. Looks like I'm, I just did a few calculations here. It looks like they're under 1.1 tight ends per play, which is very low. It's, it's uh, unusual because you almost have to have a tight end in, in, in most formations. But uh, have, the, have the Dolphins gone to some 10 this year or has it been uh, primarily 11? Yeah, it's primarily 11. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll go into um, from 21 with their fullback, uh, Alec Ingold, who's uh, kind of a pseudo tight end. You know, he'll, they'll, they'll go spread. They'll go kind of five out and put Alec Ingold out there as well and then kind of motion him back and put him in the back third and have him do some traditional stuff. So he's, he's really that, that true Swiss Army knife, and they'll throw it, uh, to him in the flat as well. All right. Well, that makes sense. A lot of sense in relative to Ricard, of course. Um, in terms of some common concepts they like to run on offense, do you have do you have a few for us that you could uh, educate us on? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's really the at, at root, you know, the, the Shanahan style style offense. So, you know, you have a lot of, um, you know, middle of the field concepts, a lot of dagger, um, you know, where you have, again, that that clear out route. And then you have uh, another uh, receiver come in, you know, on a in breaking route. And they, they really want to stress the middle of the field. But I think that one of the things that has stood out to me um, is that they, they've grown in kind of the, the diversity of where they throw the ball. So, you know, it got to a point last year where they were so proficient in covering the middle of the, uh, throwing to the middle of the field. Tool was the best uh, quarterback throwing to, you know, 
know, between the hashes and uh, in, in the intermediate part of the field. Obviously, defenses have adjusted. Um, they're doing a lot of really unique stuff, like you mentioned, um, too high, um, a lot of uh, post-snap uh, rotations to take over, a lot of robber to take, o- take away the middle of the field. So they've adjusted. So Tua isn't throwing the ball um, a- as much downfield as he was last year. Um, but, you know, they're getting the ball out quickly in terms of, you know, quick screens, uh, getting to the flat. So they have some 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 uh, kind of just like basic slat, slant, flat concepts that they use, um, you know, when teams are overcrowding uh, the, uh, the middle of the field. But, you know, keeping the Make no doubt about it. You know they're, they're going to try to get the ball in the middle of the field uh, and stress defenses that way uh, and try to uh, pick up some yak with the receivers. Okay. I, now we couldn't really have a discussion about the Miami Dolphins without looking at their relative success versus good and not so good teams. Now, obviously, and and that goes for home and road too. So let's 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 try and hit on both of those right now. So obviously the 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 team that they've beaten that had a really good record before is Dallas. But they didn't have any other uh, wins against teams with a winning record. Am I correct about that? Correct. They entered the Dallas game 0-3 against teams currently with the winning record. Okay. Um, and uh, the Ravens have kind of a remarkable record going right now in terms of beating teams with winning records. They've, they've, uh, they've beaten seven teams by at least 14 points, and all of them have a winning record. Nobody else has ever beaten more than five in the history of the NFL. So it's uh, I, I, it's you know I, I'm looking forward to a struggle that goes both ways. I mean the 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 uh, uh, I, I guess the, the the thing I'd like to focus on with you though is why is it that that the the Dolphins have had difficulty with teams that um, are good? What who, who I mean it's probably different reasons, but Buffalo for example and the other the other games they've lost against good teams. What's been the thing that's held them back? Yeah, there's layers to it. And it's the, it's the narrative that they, they can't avoid. And I guess uh, up until last week and they couldn't avoid. Um, I think it, it's it's just a lot of things that go into it. You know, first off, we, we have to just acknowledge that some of their tougher games this season have uh, been on the road. You know, they played Buffalo on the road uh, in week four, I believe. Uh, they played Philadelphia on the road and then they were away um, in Germany for the overseas game when they played the Chiefs. And, you know, I was there that that honestly felt like a Kansas City home game just the way that the, the fan base uh, turnout was. Um, so really their toughest competition has come on the road, um, but we have seen some 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 trends in terms of the, the types of those, the way that those teams were able to impact the Dolphins, especially uh, on the on the defensive side of the ball, um, you know, being able to, to, you know, be physical with the wide receivers, um, limit, um, you know, the over the top passing, get pressure on Tua, which you know, we haven't really seen because he gets the ball out so quickly. Um, so it really comes down to that. You know, I think that all the teams that were able to really give the Dolphins often uh, troubles, you know, they had strong defensive lines. They were able to get some pressure on um, Tua, and, and, and they kind of muddy things up for them. You know, even in games against, like, the Patriots, where Tua maybe didn't have, like, standout games, you know, they, they Bill Belichick brought out some, like, unique three safety uh, looks. I think that we saw some of that from the Tennessee in that Monday night football game as well. Um, so you, you mentioned it uh, kind of in passing, you know, like, muddying up the look for Tua the way that they kind of did for Brock Purdy and that Monday night game uh, that that's really key you know if you give him a if you just stay in too high you know they have the answers for just like a, a, a standard cover two cover four look they have the answers for a standard you know single high cover three look um, but it's when um, you can kind of bring those complex pressures and looks and rotations after the snap um, that's when you can force them into some mistakes and keep this offense from being so dynamic all right. Uh, we we kind of skipped the offensive line here. I want to go back through that and take us through from left to right because they've had some injuries there recently, haven't they? Uh, really all season. Um, they are on last week and marked their 11th starting offensive line combination. Wow. Um, it's just been a, a rag, not want to say a ragtag group, but just kind of a musical chairs type of operation. Um, I'll start with, I, I guess, uh, the right guard. Well, I'll say this. They're, they're playing without their starting center, Connor Williams, who was injured uh, in the Monday night football game against the Titans about two weeks ago. Um, so we have uh, Liam Eikenberg, um, who's kind of had a, a bit of a career resurgence, you know, third year player, um, high second round pick. Uh, who struggled? He's stepping into that center role, and he's kind of improved as time has, uh, has gone on. Now, this is interesting because Eichenberg is a guy who who was who came out of Notre Dame as a tackle, and I, I probably watched more Notre Dame football than any other team because that's where my wife went to school. So we, we like to watch those games. But anyway, Eichenberg um, uh, was a guy who very short armed, and I was projecting to move to probably this, at least a guard, but maybe to center. And a lot of people had that right out of school. 
Um, and he's finally getting there and probably now has a chance to be a much better player than he than he was before on the outside. Yeah, it's really been a revelation because because when they first drafted him, it, it was to kind of try him out at, at tackle and then that didn't work. And then they tried him at left guard and then uh, that didn't work. I mean, he, he started about 10 games at left guard last season and he, he was OK, probably like a replacement level at best player. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he's really I, I believe he's played every position or just about every position on the line this year, but they really needed him at center because they didn't have a, a true natural backup. Uh, I mean, again, you know, the snaps, sometimes they're, they're a little, they're a little high, a little short, they're, they're not always perfect. They've, they've had some issues with that and in including, uh, you know, um, under center snaps, um, but he's just improved. You know, he's not, he's not the strongest. He's not the fastest. He doesn't have the most toolsy player, um, but something has just kind of clicked with their offensive line coach, Butch Berry, uh, and, and they're making it work there um, at center. So um, that, that'll be interesting. It's interesting to see that matchup with him and Michael Pierce and Travis Jones and maybe Matt Abike. Um, you look at right guard, um, they have a Pro Bowl level type player in Robert Hunt, but he's been dealing with the hamstring injury. Um, he's missed the last three games. Um, he wasn't at practice on Wednesday, but McDaniel said that they're going to try to give him an uptick in practice. Um, if he doesn't play, you know, they're going to have uh, another backup in there, probably Robert Jones, um, who's a former undrafted guy. Um, right tackle, Austin Jackson, who like uh, Eichenberg, you know, he was, he was a first round pick uh, back in the same draft as two in 2020. And he was one of those guys who was looked at like a bust. He was a very athletic guy coming out of USC, but he just wasn't able to put it together. And he dealt with some injuries, um, but he's back. He's healthy. He's playing the best ball. He's really having a Pro Bowl type uh, season this year. And he just got rewarded with a new contract extension. Um, but he's been dealing with an oblique injury. He was active last week, but did not uh did not start. That's kind of been customary of this team sometimes with the offensive linemen because they really value uh, cohesiveness. Um, so if he can practice, he didn't really do much t- uh, today and on Wednesday, but if he can practice this week, I think we'll see him out there. If not, it'll be Kendall Lamb, uh, who a name you probably heard, um, yeah. you know, just a just savvy veteran, you know, 10 plus years, uh, formerly with the Tennessee Titans. He's kind of stepped into that swing tackle role. Um, so, you know, the, there's a lot going on at left guard. You know, they've been playing without Isaiah Wynn for, you know, about since week seven. Um, so Lester Cotton, uh, you know, formerly of the uh, the Raiders, you know, he he's been he's been okay, serviceable. Um, you know, they're gonna have multiple backups in there one way or another. Um, but you know, it, it really comes down to a lot of times it comes down to you know center and left tackle. And Teron Armstead uh, has been he was their big uh, free agent signing, uh, you know, two off seasons ago. Um, he's relatively healthy. You know, he's always kind of dealing with some stuff. But if they usually have him and or uh, Connor Williams, they're usually uh, pretty good, and they can. You know they can get the job done. All right, all right. It's definitely has definitely a lot of troubles. I, I, you know, the Ravens fans now really look at their offensive line and say, "Oh my God, the problems we've had this year: offensive tackle and Ronnie Stanley's not playing well." It can get worse, folks. And in the NFL, um, that replacement level degrades as the season moves on. You get players hurt and they don't return, and there's not anybody to replace them. And they, they, the practice squad is, if you're picking from there or you're picking from somebody else's practice squad, it's a reduction. Getting some feedback from you, I want to hold up your um, your uh, piece. Thank you. Um, but anyway, it's a it's a uh, uh, obviously the Dolphins are dealing with some of that this year, and I, I and now I can I can kind of see some of the reasons why this offense isn't functioning at 100. percent yeah, it's just kind of the nature of offensive line play and offensive lines. I mean, you, there, there's kind of a dearth and just kind of lack of, you know, quality backups uh, in the NFL. So a lot of times you just kind of have to make do, which is kind of natural that across the NFL, especially this time of the year, you're going to have one or two backups uh, in there. You just have to just have to work around that. All right. Outstanding. Um, let's move on to the defense and talk a little bit about it. The first thing I always like to hit on is at what what look do they like to show on third and medium to long where, you know, it's not as much about what the offense, what the opposing personnel is, as opposed to how you want to defend the sticks. Yeah, well, you have to start with, you know, the the guy who's calling the plays uh, and that, that's Vic Fangio. Um, that was kind of their big uh, off-season acquisition outside of Jalen Ramsey, who we'll get into, um, kind of the the godfather of these two high, uh, you know, post-snap rotations that we've seen. So you, you're going to get a lot of that. You're going to get a lot of cover six, uh, two high looks, uh, rotations into cover one and cover three, uh, where you have a safety uh, kind of coming down and um, kind of take away the middle of the field. That's usually what they go to. Um, you know, it, it is a lot of zone-based stuff, um, but with just the nature of the the cornerbacks that they have, they will allow them to to kind of be on an island and man up uh, in those critical downs. 
All right. Uh, outstanding. Uh, uh, let's let's talk players. And I like to start on the defensive line and any kind of information you give us on rotation or snap management. I know we got an old Baltimore face in, in Zach Sealer there. Yeah, yeah, we gotta start with Zach Sealer. You know, just got a got a, a big new contract a couple months ago, well deserved contract. Uh, so it's you know an amazing journey to, from from is this him. His you know. second extension. It is, it is. He got one uh, not too long after he was picked up uh, off waivers from Miami, uh, and then he just got a new you know lucrative extension. So it's definitely well well earned from him. So uh, shout out to him. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll start with the base package, which I think we'll we'll see a lot just because uh, the Ravens um, do have a lot of two tight end sets, a lot of uh, two running back sets with. Uh, Ricard being the fullback, um, you know, in those base formations, you know, you'll see, you know, the three down lineman, Raquan Davis at, at nose tackle. He's more of a run stuffer, uh, you know, not much of a pa- pass rush presence, but he'll take up some double teams, uh, free up some stuff for the inside linebackers. And then you have Sealer, as we mentioned before, along with Christian Wilkins. Uh, those guys will be, you know, you know, three and five techniques kind of depending on whatever uh, the alignment is. Um, you know, for Sealer, you know, I'll start with him. He's really, really broken out as a pass rusher this year. He has a career high in sacks. I believe he's up to six, six and a half. Um, So, you know, he's always been stout as a run stuffer, but he's really coming along as a pass rusher. And the same thing for Christian Wilkins, who who might be, you know, the best run defender as an interior defensive lineman um, in terms of shooting gaps. Um, But he's stepping up as a pass rusher as well. And, And they need that as well because, you know, in Vic Fangio's scheme, they're not going to uh, uh, blitz a ton. You know, every once in a while, they might do some cover zero. They might do some simulated pressures, um, but you're not going to get a ton uh, of those cover zero looks that we've seen from the past with Brian Flores and the Bilicek type tree. Um, in terms of the rotation, um, you know, they'll bring in uh, Deshaun Hand, who was a veteran pickup from them in the summer. Um, but, you know, it's kind of... Uh, not something that you see from defensive linemen, but Sealer and Wilkins will log, you know, 80, 85, maybe even 90% of the snaps, which is just, Whoa. which is just, you know, just unfathomable from a defensive lineman. But they've trusted those guys to do that dating back to last season. Uh, and Van Gio was very comfortable uh, with doing that. Okay. That, that is very unusual. Obviously, obviously not the Raven scheme. They, they're a heavy rotation team where they rarely play anybody, uh, even 60% of snaps. Matt BK is over that this year, but, uh, but they rarely do it. Um, I, it that's, that's very interesting. How about take us off ball to the linebackers? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, edge rusher wise, you know, you got to start with Bradley Chubb, um, who's reunited with Vic Fangio. Um, you know, they uh, he played under Fangio in uh, in Denver. Um, he's having his best season, you know, since his rookie year. He's up to 11 sacks, most since that uh, first year in the NFL. Um, he's really stepped up. He was a guy that they traded for last year um, at the trade deadline, and they gave a lucrative extension. So he's really playing like that type of Pro Bowl caliber play that they, they expected. Um, just has that that combination of speed and power that I think could give uh, whether it's you know Ronnie Stanley or Patrick McCarry a little bit of trouble, but he's also really stout against the run set and the edge as well. You go to the other side of the edge, ra- uh, edge rusher t- uh, tandem, you have Andrew Van Ginkle, who stepped into that full-time role in the aftermath of Jalen Phillips' injury. Phillips uh, was an emerging third-year player who was having you know his best year to date, um, but he uh, tore his Achilles uh, in their Black Friday game about a month ago. Um, so Van Ginkle was stepped into that role. Um, you know, again, he's not the most toolsy guy, not the most athletic guy, um, but you know, it's just all around very sound, good against the run. Um, you know, you know, kind of crafty as a pass rusher, and just plays very, very hard. Um, those guys will log a lot of snaps as well. Um, they might rotate uh, Melvin Ingram, who they you know brought back to the practice squad every after he spent some time last year uh, with the team last year. Um, they'll bring him in there as well. Uh, Emmanuel Agba, who's kind of fallen out of favor just because he's not the the greatest fit with that scheme um if he's if he plays on sunday because he dealt with the hamstring injury last week um you know he'll he'll get some snaps as well but again um expect chubb and van ginkle to log a pretty significant amount of snaps um you go to inside linebacker that's a position where they're also dealing with some injuries as well Jerome Baker, who's usually their every down linebacker, a uh, green dot communicator. Um, he's been uh, on IR with a knee injury, not eligible to come back until next week. Um, so he'll be out this weekend um, in his place. They've had Duke Riley. He's more of, he's been more of a special teams player throughout his career, um, but he's pretty good in coverage, has some athleticism to him, can move sideline to sideline, uh, maybe not the greatest in run, but he's played very well um, uh, since stepping into that role. Next to them, they have David Long Jr., uh, who was one of their under-the-radar signings. You know, I think that the signing of uh, – 
Ram, Jalen Ramsey and the acquisition of Vic Fangio kind of, you know, op, op, shot, overshadowed that. Um, but he was a very, very consistent player with the Tennessee Titans. The only knock on him uh, was his injuries. He's a little bit undersized. Um, he's a physical guy. He has a knack for, you know, shooting uh, gaps, um, kind of wiggling past uh, offensive linemen. Um, so he's, you know, I think he's PFF's. PFF's number one run defender at the linebacker position. So he's played very, very well. Um, again, all those guys will, will log, you know, the duration, uh, you know, they'll, they'll go you know, the distance. Um, you know, they might take long off the field um, when they go into their dime package, um, but expect Duke Riley to be there uh, just about every play. Okay. So Duke Riley, dot where usually has to stay on the field unless you have a, a, a sub that you're using that has a helmet as well. But he, he uh, uh, he's on the field for all the dime snaps and at the weak side position. They they swap out for Van Ginkle. Uh, no, Van, Van Ginkle will be there at edge. They'll they'll take out David Long and they'll bring in an extra defensive back. Okay, all right, outstanding. And they go to three safety look or a four corner look when they when they move somebody into dime. Yeah, mostly the, they'll they'll bring in a fourth corner back. Yeah, they, they haven't okay. done a lot of three safety looks at all this season. Okay, all right, that's that's interesting. Now the last time. I believe it's the last time that Fangio and the Ravens met. The Ravens, uh, Fangio really got on the Ravens after the game for having Jackson run for about five yards on the last play of the game with three seconds remaining to extend a rushing streak they had going of, of consecutive 100 yards. Was that Fangio or was that another coach? I think Fangio was out last because that was last season, all right? Fangio, I think Fangio was 20, it was 21 with, the, with Denver. I oh, I'm, I'm 99% sure it's Fangio because, okay. uh, you know, there's, no, there's always a possibility, but Fangio's <laughs> remarks about this and, you know, he had, he had worked with the Ravens before for three yeah. years and, yeah. and, you know, so it was, a, it was a big, uh, uh, loud bunch of noise. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, uh, the Ravens came out and they didn't have particularly good reasons for doing it themselves. But what Harbaugh said was, you know, this is a record that we're tying the all-time record and it's something that a lot of people have contributed to over the years and we just thought it was a good idea so we decided if we we're going to get the ball back and the interception with three seconds remaining in the end zone so they would have had one more play would have run out the clock but denver you know it had a, an interception and then they they ran for three it ran for five yards to 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 uh to make it work yeah interestingly and i would be surprised if this is not a topic or something fangio has asked for it the ravens just extended their streak to 32 games again um with a 13-yard run on the last series against the 49ers. They, they basically <laughs> abandoned the run for the entire game, but Gus Edwards ran for 13 yards. And it was it was in closeout mode. So it was not an unexpected that they'd be running the ball. San Francisco had three timeouts. So it made all kinds of sense that they'd run it. It's just all of a sudden they have one of their most successful plays of the night uh, at, a, at a time when uh, they needed it to get to 100 yards. And uh, and it was just it, it was very funny. And I'm I'm not a huge record ball fan or anything, but I'm a real fan of seeing how Nick Fangio re- reacts to that. And, yeah. And- yeah, I just I just looked now. Yeah, you're right. That was Fangio a couple of years back. Um, yeah, obviously, yes. History with the team, you know, being on the coaching staff. Um Maybe not one of those. Maybe one of those things that he kind of keeps in the back of his mind will be interesting. They've been very good against the run, mm-hmm. um, and you know that's definitely a priority for them. So I know he'll, he'll definitely be keying on stopping the run, especially after uh, you know that incident a couple years back. Yeah, it's it is a, a certainly a game. If the way you're describing the Dolphins' defense, it would seem to me that it'd be very important for the Ravens to try and win snap count and stay on the field as long as possible. Which is something with Roman they were able to do because they were really grinding out drives in the way. And I, I think you were here for a fair amount of that era, right? So yes. Um, so so you know it, that was their that was their go to move was these nice grinded out drives. Now they're much more of a big play offense. They they have a lot of pass plays to get down the field, and they, they have shorter drives, and uh, they've had some interceptions which have created short fields now. And they've they've uh, uh, they've not been as consistent winning snap count. But this is a game where if you if you know if you're facing defenders who play that high a percentage of snaps on the defensive line in particular, that's a great that's a great game to win snap count. Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, th- there is an opportunity and I'm really interested to see um, how the Ravens run offense fares against the Dolphins run defense, because again, they, they haven't allowed a 100 yard rusher in some time. Um, I think that the teams that have had more success against them was run def- uh, this defense, they've been able to run the ball, control it. Um, you know, if you drop back so many times at some point, you know, this pass rush is going to to lean on you and, and, and you know, affect the, the passer. Um, so, you know, we know what Lamar can do off script, um, but I'm interested to see in the in the standard. You know, I know Todd Munkin has kind of diversified some of their their run game as well, while keeping elements of the, the Roman scheme. I'm interested to see 
how much they can get in kind of those traditional runs uh, with Gus Edwards and, uh, and Justice Hill. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, you know, five, six yards, whether it's, you know, three, four yards just to kind of, you know, keep you in those um, in those manageable third downs. Very interested to see um, which side uh, gets the advantage on Sunday. Yeah. All right. Well, take us to, to the uh, defensive backfield and work work through that. Yeah, so this was a a unit that was uh you know the the most hyped part of this defense. You know, this was a defense that entered the year with top ten um, expectations and mainly because of the defensive back, uh, you know, the defense and the secondary. Um, you know, you you start with Jalen Ramsey, who they you know kind of got. On, for a steal, you know, a third round pick and, you know, a uh, uh, seldom used tight end. Um, they had to give him a new deal, but they brought in Jalen Ramsey. He has, uh, he's probably the most well-versed player in this defense dating back to his time uh, with, you know, Raheem Morris back with the Los Angeles Rams. He had, you know, he had the star role where he was um, closer to the line of scrimmage and, 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 you know, lining up in the slot. Uh, he hasn't been doing that as much uh, in Van Gio's scheme since he returned from his uh, meniscus injury that forced him to miss the first eight games of the season. He's mainly been an outside corner. Um, you know, they, they haven't asked him to shadow very much. The only time he's done that exclusively was against the Jets a couple weeks ago with Garrett Wilson. And that was only because Xavier Howard, his counterpart, was out of the game. Um, so I wouldn't really expect him to, you know, shadow whether it's Safe Flowers or Odell Beckham or Shot Bateman. I think he would stay um, on what would it be the the left side? Uh, maybe getting that flipped, um, but the left side of the of the defense. Um, and then you have Xavier Howard. Um, you know, another Pro Bowl, All Pro cornerback, a little getting up there in age. Um, but I think he's had kind of a resurgent year in a scheme where you know he's usually a man-to-man uh, type player like Ramsey. But I think that this scheme has been good for him to not you know have as much wear and tear on his body following guys. He has really good ball skills and uh, really good in anticipating uh, routes route concepts. So I think that this scheme has been uh, really good for him. Um, you have the corner uh, slot position uh, with Cater Kohu. Um, he was an undrafted uh, rookie last year, and he was really a revelation for the team because they had a, a slew of injuries uh, to the secondary, and he stepped up in a big way. Um, he struggled at times this year. Uh, I think because of injuries, he's, he's had to play out of position on the outside. Um, and then obviously, when you have two all-pro, pro ball type cornerbacks on the outside uh, this year, um, you know he's kind of the weak link, so to speak. Um, so he's been kind of targeted at times uh, throughout the season um, in that slot position. So I'm interested to see what they, what the Ravens do there um, for, you know, I mentioned it before when they go into dime, they'll bring in uh, Nick Needham, who was also an undrafted guy from a couple years back. He came from an Achilles injury, hasn't played a ton, uh, but he's gotten some reps in, in those dime looks that they, that they go to sometimes on uh, on third downs uh, when the opposing offense goes into 11 personnel or four wide, they'll bring in dime with Nick Needham. Um, the safety position is, is one that I'll be monitoring health wise. Um, because the what they call who they call the cornerback uh, the quarterback of uh, this defense Javon Holland he's missed the last month with a sprained MCL in both knees you don't, don't wow. really hear that much uh, but yeah very uh, weird injury that he has been dealing with since the Black Friday game um, he. Was, did it both happen at the same time? They both happened. It, in the it same did. Game? He did. He had a very awkward tackle in the Jets game, um, and he was fine afterward. Talked to reporters, um, but you know the way he described it to me that there, there's a lot of instability with that, um, and they've been taking it very, very slow and being very cautious with him. Um, but he had an uptick in practice reps uh, on Wednesday. I think that it's looking good for him to potentially return on Sunday, and if he gets back, um, that's a big boost uh, because he he can do it all. You know, we, we all remember the 2021 game where the Dolphins blitzed Lamar and so of you know oblivion and um he played a big role in that um his role has changed a little bit in Vic Fangio's scheme um he does some obviously he'll he'll monitor you know half the field in those two deep uh looks um he'll do some single high stuff but a lot of times though they'll bring him down uh, as a robber to kind of take over the middle of the field um and, and be closer to the line of scrimmage um you know we have a familiar name in Deshaun Elliott uh you know started his career in Baltimore he's had a really strong year after you know signing with them uh from from Detroit last season um you know he he mans most of the single high looks when they go into that um you know but they like his physicality they know that he can you know as we all know, he can do a lot of stuff close to the line of scrimmage and uh, and hit. What kind of little update on Deshaun Elliott's career that I'd be interested in? He he was a what I call a always a guided missile going for the midsection of the opponent rather than a really true natural easy bracket safety. 
I mean, he, he's not trying to play for the overthrow very often in his case. His PDs are usually to the body, or they were when he was in Baltimore. And it meant he was less of an interception um, uh, you know, magnet. He was, a, he was less good at finding the football, frankly, than, than some other safeties. Geno Stone, world of difference in terms of the, the, the two of them and how they play. Stone, not a great tackler. And uh, Elliott, that's something I kind of associate with him, but, but also just the physicality. Has he changed at all as he's gotten older? Yeah, it's funny. In terms of like the the heat seeking missile, we were actually joking about that. Uh, some of the reporters that you know, you, you know, he, he was told that you know he has to kind of change the way he plays in terms of the physicality, and that's kind of why he, he always got hurt. Um, in terms of coverage, yeah, I mean, he he's more of a guy who um just kind of you know monitors the, the back end. You know, he's not a big interception guy, um, but he has a lot of you know again he has he's really like a, has a physical nature to him, and um you know he's talked about how this is a safety led defense. He, he's not really a ball hawk in that sense, um, but it's more so about being sound on the backhand and making sure they don't have those coverage busts and, and they're not letting anybody pass the last line of defense. All right. Very good. Um, anything else you want to talk about in terms of the defense or maybe how they'll, uh, or other. De- uh, defense yeah. Back? I mean, kind of rounding out the safeties. If, if for whatever reason, Holland is not able to play Brandon Jones would, uh, would, once again, step into that starting role. Um, you know, he, another player, you know, came back from an ACL injury from last year um, in, in, you know, the previous regime, um, a different defensive scheme. He was kind of like an extra linebacker, you know, a box safety. Um, you know, he was blitzed as much as any safety in the NFL and was very good at it. Um, I, he's not the greatest fit in this, uh, this scheme, you know, as a, as a, you know, uh, single high, too deep guy, but you know he did have two interceptions a couple of weeks back. He's improved, um, but you know if Holland isn't in there, you know he's so important to the communication and whatnot. You know there are some kind of cracks and some uh, opportunities to be made. I mean we saw the Dallas Cowboys get you know a big running catch touchdown with CD Lamb over the middle of the field. Holland does kind of sway this game a lot just with um, you know he's never out of place and he keeps everybody in line. He, he's that important to this unit. How, how did the Dolphins injury report look today? Because you mentioned a lot of injuries in terms of, of players. Yeah, they had they had seven guys, I believe, uh, who didn't not who did not practice. And you know, kind of interestingly, Tua Tagovailoa was on there for one of the only times he's been on the injury report with the left thumb. That's his throwing hand um, and a quad injury. So that, that's something interesting. We we didn't know this, you know, prior to you know prior to speaking to him you know not too long ago um, so that's something to monitor i think the most important injuries to monitor in terms of in terms of did not practice uh are, are probably jalen waddle um because mm-hmm. of that high ankle sprain I, again i'd just be really surprised if he practices before friday if at all tyree kill didn't practice but that's that's more maintenance raheem moster devon hn uh teron armstead that's more maintenance rob hunt the right guard i mentioned before uh was a guy that mcdaniel said would get an uptick in practice reps but he didn't practice at all so I, i'm not sure if that bodes well for uh, his availability on sunday but we'll, i think thursday will be very telling okay all right, very good. Now, Ravens have a, a very long injury report to do it today at what was an estimation from a late afternoon walkthrough, but we don't need to go into that specifically here. It, 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 looking at what the Dolphins need to defend against the Ravens, and obviously Jackson you know, it comes first, what will they do special for him? Well, I, I think whenever you play – Lamar Jackson or a guy of his talents, you know, you look at uh, who's going to be the spy, who is going to kind of monitor him over the middle of the field. Um, you know, when they've played Josh Allen, you know, they've they've asked a guy like Javon Holland to be that spy again. So, like, they'll have somebody else play, you know, the 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 deep the deep part of the field with in single high, and then they'll ask Javon Holland to to uh, to, to spy him. Um, Holland didn't really give too much insight. He said, I don't know who's going to do that, but it's a challenge. If not him, maybe a guy like Duke Riley, um, because he's going to be on the field every, every play, and he does have uh, some speed to him. Um, so that's going to be really interesting. You know, again, with, with Banjo, they've only played so many, like, true mobile quarterbacks, and I would say um, – you know, I guess the three this season would be Josh Allen, uh, Jalen Hurts, and Patrick Mahomes. They haven't really done a ton of spying, you know, because they are a zone-based uh, uh, defense anyway. Um, but with Lamar, it'll be interesting to see um, if they kind of change up their tendencies because I think that they, they'll feel confident about the outside matchups uh, with the Ravens wide receivers against their own cornerbacks and, and fellow DBs. They, they might, you know, play a little bit more man than we expect um, and, and result and you know, in, play a spy in the middle of the field. So it'll be interesting to see if they switch up any tendencies. 
man man is a is an interesting concept against Lamar Jackson because he can certainly make you pay if you don't have the eyes on him um, yeah. uh, to deal with that. Uh, the Ravens obviously have lost a big weapon in terms of Keaton Mitchell in terms of the running back group. Is there anything special they need to do um, with regard to to dealing with the Ravens? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's one. I'm not sure about that, and I think that that loss of Mitchell is is very is very significant because I, I had always compared him to Devon Achan with with the mm-hmm. Dolphins, where he just has that big play threat. I think it's another thing, another situation where they'll they'll trust their guys, and I think that they feel they'll feel very confident um, in winning their one on one matchups and controlling the edge. You mentioned Achan and Mitchell, and by the way, they're they're linked um, in terms of a historic Devoa number. They the for forty plus car- carries. During the entire history of Devo, which goes back to, to 1981, they're the two highest individual Devo players, 2023 Mitchell and Achan. So it's been a, it's been a remarkable uh, run for those guys. And and uh, Achan, I saw he had 3.4 yards per carry this last game, so he, he backed off some of his top stats. I know we're in Baltimore. We're certainly you know jealously defending who Mitchell is because he's been such a great player for them, but uh, in, yeah. in an incredible impact in limited time. Uh, take us through now one player on each side of the ball that you think matches up well. I'm not a score prediction guy, so just one player on each side of the ball you think matches up well against the Ravens. Uh, well, for, for the Dolphins offense, I'll, I'll obviously say Tyree Kill. Um, you know, he gave them so much trouble uh, in, in that past game. I think a lot of that, uh, especially the week two matchup, was a lot of busted coverages, especially late in that game. You know, Marlon wasn't in there. That was definitely before they, they really figured things out with Kyle Hamilton and the best way to use him as well. And I think that that's a guy who could really swing this game um, either way. Uh, but again, if, if Jalen Waddle isn't in the game, you know, It'll be interesting to see what they do. Do they do they bracket him a little bit? I think the, the Cowboys have to do that at times, and the Dolphins found answers to that in terms of like quick screens and getting the ball out quickly. Um, so so definitely Tyree Kill. And I'd say maybe Devon Achan because I think that they want to use him uh, as a as a pass catcher more. Um, so does he get lined up with you know Roquan Smith and uh, um, or, or Patrick Queen sometimes? And can they find some advantages uh, in maybe man situations or whatnot? Um, on the other side of the ball, um, I'll say Bradley Chubb. Um, you know. Uh, you know, Ronnie Stanley has, you know, dealt with some 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 lingering injury. I thought he had a pretty pretty solid game. Um, and you know, oh, you're not, yeah, oh, you're, you're, oh, yeah. I know he had some, yeah, he had some help. He had some help as well. Uh, but you know, you know, he, he has kind of gone through it, kind of kind of gone through some some bumps with with that knee. Um, so again, with with Bradley Chubb, he he's not, you know, a a TJ Watt. Uh, you know, Michael Parsons, a uh, Bosa type guy. Um, but he's been playing very very well and just. Just knowing, you know, what's going on with Stanley and uh, the rotation that they've done with him and Makari, um, I think that that's a matchup um, that could give uh, Lamar and you know that 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 Ravens offense trouble. All right, all right, outstanding, uh, great stuff, Daniel. We appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Tell folks where they can talk, uh, talk football with you online or find your work. Yeah, first off, you can find me on social media uh, at Daniel Yafusi. That's Daniel O Y E F U S I. Uh, Miami Herald, MiamiHerald dot com, uh, as well as the Dolphins in that podcast, which I host uh, uh, every week, talking all things Dolphins. All right, outstanding. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. I want to talk to you. I want to hear your idea. We'll boil it down to something we can talk in about 15 to 20 minutes and provide some uh, non-intimidating, shorter content that people maybe will be more likely to listen to and and get introduced to to the uh, show. But I appreciate you folks for your loyal listening. Uh, Daniel, thanks again for being on. Not for sure. Thanks for having me. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study.